priest of the cathedral, Bishop Hugh, um, and this series of talks on the Most Holy Eucharist. And tonight's uh, subject is the institution of the Last Supper. So um, I'm very pleased to welcome you all. Good to see some folks from the chaplaincy. We were at Mass a bit earlier. And um, uh, Bishop Hugh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone, and uh, this is the second of uh, the proposed uh, seven talks, God permitting. Now, in the first talk, I tried to put uh, the Eucharist in context, first in, as it were, the big picture, uh, and then uh, in the context of the church. So, just to briefly summarize what I said uh, last time, that first of all, the Eucharist, we can say, is, is present but hidden in nature, in grain, cereals, and grapes, in human life, meals, and in human worship, which is often turned on the offering of sacrifice. So it is hidden in those things. Then one stage up, one notch up, it is foreshadowed in the Old Testament, for example, in the Passover, the manna, and Israel's sacrificial worship. It was instituted by Jesus Christ at his last meal with the disciples, what we call the Last Supper. It is celebrated in the church subsequently, and it will reach its fulfillment in the heavenly banquet of the world to come. And then, if we focus more particularly on the life of the church, the Eucharist is not something marginal or dispensable. It is, in, in the phrase that Vatican II uses several times, the source and summit of the Christian life. Uh, we can say it's the center, but it's a living center. We might compare it to a heart. The heart is not the whole body, but it benefits the whole body and it it purifies our blood, it oxygenates our blood, it brings life and health to the whole body. A healthy heart means a healthy body. So that's maybe a metaphor for what the Eucharist is. So that was the first talk. But now we can turn to the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. We celebrated this recently uh, at Maundy Thursday. So Jesus is at the end, the climax of his life and of his public ministry, and he knows it. St. John is very strong on this. He knows. He knows his enemies are closing in on him. He knows there is a traitor in his own ranks. And so he wants to gather the, his closest friends around him one last time to spend time with them, to eat with them, and to show them through words and gestures how much he loves them. He wants to convey to them clearly, uh, fully, who he is and what he is about. It was, we remember, uh, the time of the Passover, the first of the three great annual Jewish feasts, and Jesus and his disciples were in Jerusalem for the feast. So on what would be the evening before his arrest and trial and execution, the night before he suffered, as we say, he summoned his disciples to an upstairs room. Uh, it, it was through a contact. They must have had a a contact in that part of Jerusalem. And there he ate with his disciples, washed their feet, spoke with them at length, and prayed for them. There's a lot happens on that last evening. It's very dense, it's packed. And above all, he instituted the Eucharist. Now we know of this uh, through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and from a passage from St. Paul's 
first letter to the Corinthians. So we have four accounts in the New Testament of the Last Supper. From uh, the Gospel of John, we have, you remember, the great discourse in his chapter 6, which is set earlier in Jesus' ministry, where he speaks of himself as the bread of life and of the need to eat his flesh and drink his blood. So though there is no account in the Gospel of John of the Lord instituting this sacrament at the end of his life, um, the, the chapters, there are five chapters that uh, the Gospel of John devotes to Jesus' last, last evening, seem to presuppose it. Certainly, a meal is mentioned. And in fact, those chapters, that's chapters 13 to 17 of John, can be read really as a spiritual commentary on the Eucharist. It's not mentioned, and yet it's, it's there. So we can say that the institution of the Eucharist by Jesus at the end of his life is well as attested. And thanks, uh, of course, to, the, to our celebration of the Eucharist, we are familiar with his words and gestures on this occasion. And we hear them in the liturgy, and so I'll quote them in the form uh, that they appear are familiar to us from the Roman liturgy because this, uh, there's Matthew and Mark on one side, they, their description of the Last Supper is very similar, and St. Luke and St. Paul are similar, but different, not radically different, but with different phrases and some different or, uh, order of events. But this is what we're familiar with. This is, say, from the Third Eucharistic Prayer. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you, the Father, thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples. Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Well, that is all very familiar, and it's, it's a kind of conflation of what we read in the four accounts. So it's these gestures and words and the whole context of the Last Supper that we will ponder this evening. So the question is, what was Jesus doing? What was he intending? What did he mean? What would the disciples have understood? What has the church over the centuries come to see in this event, it was a climactic moment of Jesus's earthly life. It directly preceded the events of his death and resurrection. So I think it was more than a random gesture of farewell. There is something premeditated about it. So with due reverence and guided by faith, let's try and explore this. And I'm going to offer three different approaches as to what was going on in the upper room on that evening. In, it was Jerusalem. It was springtime. Remember that. The time we are in, probably our month of April. Well, here's a first approach. Um, the accounts all set the Last Supper in the context of the Jewish feast of the Passover. Jesus chose the time of the Passover to institute the Eucharist. So, to, to quote St. Luke, then came the day of unleavened bread, which was part of the Passover, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover meal for us, that 
we may eat it. They went and prepared the Passover, and when the hour came, he sat at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So it was during this Passover meal that Jesus instituted the Eucharist. This is not a, a coincidence. It was a chosen context, and it helps us understand what is going on. So, let's go on a little excursion here. But we must never forget that Jesus was a Jew. We do forget, actually. Uh, he was a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of David. He was an Israelite of the tribe of Judah. So the scriptures he knew, there was no New Testament, didn't exist. The scriptures he knew, the feasts he kept, the prayers he, he had learned, the stories he had been told, were all those of Israel. Mary, uh, as his mother, and St. Joseph would have initiated him into all these things. This was his culture. He was Jewish genetically, culturally, in every possible way. And this shaped the way he thought and prayed and even ate. He would have observed the kosher laws of that time. And not least, it meant that he shared the hopes of his people. They were his too. And if the Jews were anything, uh, they were good hopers. That was, that was the thing. They had something to hope for. The poor old pagans had very little to hope for. But the Jews hoped. Now, there was a great spread of hopes, and there was a lunatic fringe. There was a terrorist fringe, you might say. But that aside, we can venture this, that what they hoped for, from different perspectives, was a new exodus. Now, the exodus, that takes us back to the people's liberation from Egypt that had taken place some 14 centuries before Christ. But I don't just mean you know, the story we all know about them, uh, the people trailing out of Egypt across the Red Sea, the Egyptian army charging after them and coming to an unhappy end in the waters while the people uh, walk through safely to the other side and set off on their journey to the Promised Land. That's, if you like, uh, the short, the abbreviated version of the Exodus. But the full story of the Exodus is much bigger. Uh, and it, it has these sort of elements in it. it it's driven by, it's uh, moved by it, the faithful and merciful love of the Lord who had chosen Abraham's descendants. He it is, who leads them out of Egypt under the guidance of Moses. Then you remember, they come, they go out into the, into the wilderness, and they go for a rendezvous, as it were, with the Lord at the foot of Mount Sinai. They receive the law, and the, a covenant is ratified in the blood of bulls at the foot of the mountain, and the people the Israelites become, the Hebrews, as they are called at this stage, the Hebrews become the people of God. They become the Lord's dedicated people. They are, as it were, married to the Lord through this covenant. Then, it's all part of the Exodus in the big version. Forty years later, the entry into the Promised Land the establishment of a kingdom centered on Jerusalem. They've got, they've got a land, they've got a capital city, and they've got a king, the shepherd king, David. And then, under the, David's son, Solomon, the temple is built. The, 
where the Ark of the Covenant was kept and the Lord took up his dwelling. Now that's the full version of the story. That spans 400 years. And it was good. It was all very good. It was positive. It was a fulfillment of promises. I mean, it had its hairy moments on the way, certainly, in the wilderness and trying to take possession of the promised land and all of that, but they'd got there. You might actually just think of someone, uh, let's say someone who's had a good upbringing and uh, they, uh, they've had a good education, uh, they get a good job, uh, they, they, they buy a nice house, they've got a nice family, and everything's hunky-dory. It's all fine. The promises of life are somehow fulfilled for them. And then it starts to unravel. Then it starts to go wrong. So the Exodus is like this upward movement, this upward arc. But then, and it reaches a climax in the building of the temple. And then it all starts to go wrong. The people ceased to be faithful to the covenant. False gods came to be worshipped. The kingdom divided into two. Foreign invasion weakened it further. And finally, the Babylonians destroyed the holy city, burned the temple, and led most of the people away from their land to exile. The complete opposite. This was the anti-Exodus. This was everything going massively, seriously wrong. And even though some 500 years before Christ, some of the Jews returned, when the Persians took control, even though, yes, the Jews were allowed back to their land, but there were no more kings of the dynasty of David. The temple was rebuilt, sure, and gloriously so in our Lord's time under Herod, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It now held no Ark of the Covenant and no presence and the pagan Romans colonized the land and oppressed the people. Now, some prophets had hailed the return from exile as a new exodus, but it was unfinished business, and the humbled people of Jesus' time felt themselves very far from the holiness that the covenant called for. And so, the yearning, the hope arose for a new exodus, a new liberation, fuller and deeper, for a new covenant, for the forgiveness of sins, for a, a, a work of God that would enable them to be unbreakably linked with them, so that they would stop their incessant backsliding and falling away. They would be truly God's people, and he would be their God. The, the, the great desire, even the poor old Pharisees who get such a slagging in the Gospels, the great desire of the Jews of that time was for purity, that they could be pure before God. It, it hadn't happened, and they were longing for this. They were longing for a new experience of the faithful and merciful love of the Lord, for the realization of God's purposes for them so that they could fulfill their identity, so that they could embark on their mission to the rest of the world. Okay, now that's a sort of digression, but not a digression. This brings us back to the Passover, because the Passover was the first of the three great annual Jewish feasts, and as I say, it fell in springtime. It drew huge crowds of Jews. Uh, from within Palestine, but from all around the Mediterranean and from the Near East. I mean, the ancient people said millions came up. Well, you know, they were 
they, they would multiply figures quite freely in those days, but a lot of people came to Jerusalem. The, it, the place was packed. The place was simmering because it was the great liturgical focus for the people's hope. Now, you, you will remember the first reading on Maundy Thursday comes from Exodus chapter 12, and it describes the original, the first uh, Passover, organized, as it were, by Moses, which fell on the eve, the evening before the original exodus, the evening before the people set out from Egypt on the way to freedom. It was the curtain raiser, as it were. By Jesus' time, it was celebrated annually. It allowed this feast every generation to remember God's great act of liberation, it allowed them to feel that they were part of it, and it prompted a wave of hope that God would remember them, that there would be a new exodus, that God's people would be set free by his merciful and faithful love. So Jerusalem would have been, you know, Jerusalem this year with Ramadan and uh, Easter and Passover all coinciding, has been tense, tense, tense. It would have been like that at Passover time, and the Roman garrison would have been reinforced because they expected trouble. Now, this is the context, not by chance, in which our Lord celebrated the Last Supper and instituted the Eucharist. So I hope this is making some kind of sense. Okay. And at the Passover, at the heart of the Passover, was the lamb, the lamb. The one-year-old, unblemished, it had to be a perfect wee lamb, healthy male. Now, in the time of Jesus, the lambs were sacrificed first in the temple, and the blood of the lambs was poured out there. But then the lamb... Each family would, it was a family feast, so each family would take its lamb to the temple. The lamb would be sacrificed and its blood offered to God, and then it would be skewered, uh, the, 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 the flesh, like in a butcher's shop, as it were, and the, the family would take it home, roast it, and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs and different glasses of wine, or pottery vessels of wine, I suppose. And the story of the exodus would be recalled, and the hope of a new deliverance prayed for. The prayers that were used at the Passover were prayers for the liberation of Jerusalem, the liberation of the people. And on the basis of that original sacrificed lamb, and the protection afforded by its blood and the strength given by its flesh, the people of the first exodus left Egypt, free people, free people at last. And then in the different celebrations, year after year, the celebration, the, the celebrating people would feel a surge of hope that they were going to be delivered. Now, isn't it strange uh, isn't it very suggestive that none of the four accounts of Jesus' Last Supper speak of eating a lamb? It's as though it's mentioned by Luke at the beginning that the, the Passover lamb was sacrificed at the time of the... But it's never mentioned in the accounts that Jesus and his disciples ate a lamb. The lamb has vanished, in a sense. All the attention goes on the prayer of Jesus, his prayer of thanksgiving and blessing, on the bread and the wine, and the words he speaks. So it seems that what Jesus did at the Last Supper was remodel, recraft the ancient rite and inserted what we know as the Eucharist, into the middle of it. 
Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas sort of speaks of this in his famous hymn. But Jesus gave the disciples his flesh to eat. He didn't say, have some lamb chaps. He gave them his flesh to eat, and shockingly, very shockingly, for Jews, for us too, really, his blood to drink, not just a sprinkle, but to drink. And when he spoke of his body and blood, he spoke of them as given for you and poured out for you and for many. That sacrificial language. So what's the conclusion? That he is now the lamb. He is the lamb. He has taken over the lamb, as it were. The lamb has been forgotten. He is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, as John the Baptist had said at the very beginning, by his sacrifice, and he feeds God's people with his own body and blood. So the Eucharist is something new. It's not an animal sacrifice anymore. Animal sacrifice has come to an end. It is the self-gift of God-made man, of Christ. It is his sacrifice and his banquet, the sacrifice of the lamb, the banquet of the lamb. At the Last Supper, Jesus made himself the Paschal lamb. Amazing, if you think of it. So what was he doing? He was realizing Israel's hopes. Through his new supper, remember, the Passover happened on the brink the evening before the Exodus. Okay. And through his new Passover, he was launching, starting, inaugurating the new exodus, the deeper and fuller deliverance that he and they were longing for. So he speaks of the blood of the covenant. He speaks of the, the words of consecration that we know speak of a new and eternal covenant. The speech of the forgiveness of sins. These are phrases from Exodus chapter 24 and Jeremiah chapter 31. They're taking up and transfiguring ancient, the ancient practice and the long-held expectations. We've got, with Jesus, new Passover, new Exodus, new covenant, new people, new holiness, a new closeness to God. I will be their God and they shall be my people. It all begins in the upper room. Already, you may remember, in Luke chapter 9, in St. Luke's account of the transfiguration on the mountain, Moses and Elijah appear talking to Jesus about the exodus he was to accomplish in Jerusalem. The gospel uses that very word. And we remember also how St. John begins his account of Jesus' last evening saying that Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to pass from this world to the Father. To pass from this world. That's the language of the Passover. That's the language of Exodus. So the Last Supper was not an old boy's reunion. It wasn't the mere farewell party of a group of chums. It wasn't a last visit to the pub for the chaps whose hero and master was about to be promoted to glory. It was something that sprang from the long history of Israel and from deep, deep within our Lord himself, from his Jewishness, from his mind and heart, from his sense of the mission he had received from his Father to lead humanity through his sacrifice as the Lamb 
into the freedom of the children of God. It sprang, we might say, from Jesus' prayer. It's a beautiful thing. If you then look up, I won't read it out because otherwise we might be here all night, but if you read number 1340 of the Catechism, 11340 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it's, it's very beautifully summed up. All the, diff the play on, on Passover in that, all the way to the eternal Passover to the kingdom of God. It's very beautifully done. So that's the first approach. Now I promise that's the longest one, okay. So I've, I've got two more, two more ways in. It's, it's as though we are, you know, we're, we're you know, we, we, we've got a little ladder up to the upper room on the outside and we're peering in through the window to see what's going on and trying to understand it. So here's another approach. The Lord instituted the Eucharist on the day before he suffered, on the night he was betrayed, as our liturgy says. In other words, against a very dark background, as well as a very tense situation in Jerusalem. I mean, Jerusalem does tension big time, but it was doing it then, as well as doing it now. And immediately after the Last Supper, you remember, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he falls on his face on the ground. He is flattened by the full horror of what he is about to endure. Father, if it be possible, let this cup, interesting, talks about a cup again, pass from me. He's then arrested, he is tried, successively before the Jewish and the Roman authorities, sentenced to death and executed. You killed him, as St. Peter lately, later and bluntly tells his Jerusalem audience. Externally, Jesus is a victim. Terrible things befall him. He is done away with. He dies and he's buried. He has apparently no agency of his own. Throughout the Passion, he's the object of the malevolent actions of others. Not all malevolent, but mainly. And we know uh, the impact of this on the disciples. They just scarpered. They just ran away. Okay, it was too much. It was all too horrible. Now, at the Last Supper, and all the accounts, the four accounts, in, uh, and St. John as well, indicate this in a variety of ways. Jesus is radiantly in charge. He's the Lord. And in the Eucharist, what he does, he knows, he knows, St. John kept saying this, he knows, he knows. He knows how this is going to impact the disciples. What, what's going to happen tomorrow is going to be far, far worse than they imagined. And what he does by instituting the Eucharist is offer his dis disciples another perspective on his passion. Now, in the short term, this had no effect whatsoever. They still ran away. They made their first communion and abandoned him except on the beloved disciple. But in the long term, what Jesus does has shaped our whole understanding of the Paschal mystery. At the Last Supper, it's very important, we, we don't know, the, the two words are used. Jesus gives thanks and Jesus blesses God. These are, and, and the gifts probably, this is the origin of our Eucharistic prayer. This is what our Eucharistic prayer is, is the extension of the, the thanksgiving of Jesus. But um, Jesus gives thanks to the Father on the eve of his passion. He gives thanks 
do we, do we get that? He blesses his father. It was a great Jewish thing to do, was to bless God. And he blesses his father and thanks him at this very moment. He, going through it again, takes bread, breaks it and shares it and says, St. Paul's version, this is my body which will be given up for you. Now, when our Lord uses the word body here, he's not referring to a part of himself, body as opposed to mind or body as opposed to soul. He means his whole being, his whole self. Then a little later, he takes a cup of wine, shares it, and declares it to be his blood, the blood of a new covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many. And when he says blood, he means, as a Jew would, his life. So he's spoken of his self and of his life, uh, poured out to death. But he is um, talking of what will happen to him the next day, the horrible things. He is talking of them in terms of his body being given and his blood poured out. He's referring to his forthcoming death. But he's not referring to it as something that will be done to him, but as something unspeakably generous that he will be doing for us. He was talking about himself as a sacrifice and as a sacrifice freely made. There are echoes in these words of his of the suffering servant of Isaiah who bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors and poured himself out, poured out himself to death actively. So I hope I'm making this clear. Jesus it was not simply a victim. This is what he was saying. Don't be fooled by what will happen tomorrow or what will happen that very night from the moment that he's arrested and loses his own freedom of movement. He was an agency. He was, to use religious language, a priest. He was offering himself. He was not like a kitten being drowned in a bucket or a ship uh, going down under gunfire. Now, certainly he suffered, he suffered to the end in every sense. He absorbed all human suffering, but he did so willingly. He did so as the Son of God made man in sovereign freedom out of love for us because he chose to obey the will of his Father which desired our salvation in this way. So I, I hope I'm, I'm getting this across. On Friday, he's the victim. On Thursday evening, he's the priest. It, and he is therefore giving his disciples the true interpretation of what the passion is. By the gestures he made at the Last Supper, breaking and giving bread, sharing the cup of wine, and by the language he used, he was, as it were, taking the scandal of the cross away from his disciples. He was showing that this was not merely a passion, which is something undergone, but an action, something he was doing. He was reassuring his disciples that he was not about to be simply overwhelmed by hostile circumstances and that they were not about to witness his defeat but his victory, that he does what he does and says what he says while thanking and blessing God is saying the same thing. His passion is a prayer. His passion is a thanksgiving to his Father and a blessing for him and for those who receive it. So in the, the great prayer in John, Father, the hour has come Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. On the cross, Jesus is not just being beaten up by human beings. He is glorifying 
his father and being glorified by his father. So we can say that Jesus was taking the disciples to the inside of the passion. On the outside, it was shock and horror. Uh, on the outside, it, it, you know, it was Mel Gibson, really, you know, that, that, that version of the passion. It was, but on the inside, it was something other and transforming. It was thanksgiving and praise. It was offering. It was an act of atonement. It was a going to the Father. It would issue in the resurrection. All this, Jesus was, you might say, embodying, embedding in the institution of the Eucharist and therefore in every Eucharistic celebration. So the Second Vatican Council picks up a phrase from the Council of Trent and says that the Eucharist represents or makes present the victory and triumph of his death. You know, the Mass is not Ober Amagau. You know, we don't come along with a hammer and nails to Mass. What we hear are, this is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. It's not a passion play. And his resurrection is in there too. In the Eucharist, in sacramental form, Jesus anticipates his self-offering to the Father and its acceptance by the Father expressed in the Father's raising of him from the dead. So, again, it, this was not mere gesture, this was not play acting, it was already in the Last Supper the reality. You might say, in the Last Supper, Jesus pledged himself to give himself on the following day. He was, he was doing this. And it, it, this is good to remember for ourselves because this is the power the Eucharist gives us. When we feel overwhelmed by circumstances, hostile circumstances, when we feel stripped of agency, when we feel victims, if we can receive the Eucharist, we receive, as it were, the agency of Jesus, which is his love which had the power to transform the hostility into an offering of himself to God. Okay, now we come to the last approach, and this will be even shorter, I promise. <laughs> uh, a last approach. Now, there, there could be so many others, and, you know, if, as I say, if we're, we're up on the ladder, peering into the upper room and seeing the, the oil lamps and the flickering shadows on the wall, well, there's so much so much we could see. But when he instituted the Eucharist, uh, Jesus was proclaiming his death, as St. Paul says, uh, the good news of his death, its sacrificial transformative power. But there's something else happening. Because at the same time, Jesus commands his disciples to do this in memory of him or as a memorial of him. Now that takes us again back to the original Passover, because this day will be a day of remembrance for you, the Lord says through Moses, and it is the Passover must be repeated so that you remember. But again, Jesus takes something up and transforms it. He takes it up to take it further. Jesus, far more than Balaam in the Old Testament, I always like the phrase, is a man with far-seeing eyes. Jesus sees very far in the upper room. He sees all the way back to the Exodus. He sees all the way forward to us, to his second coming indeed. The high priestly prayer of Jesus which St. John links to this night, in it Jesus prays not just for his immediate disciples, but for all who through their word, their preaching, will believe in me. And he says his blood will be poured out for you, his disciples, round the table, and 
for many. And for many, there's this further horizon. There's a little circle in the room, but Jesus looks beyond for the many. In other words, the many who are the innumerable crowd of believers, of the redeemed and of believers. And in the Eucharist, this is the third thing, Jesus creates the ultimate form of outreach. There's nothing, there's nothing comparable to it in history. I, I can't think of anything remotely like this. The, he had been building up an intimacy with his disciples. You remember at the Last Supper, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And now he's going to take this intimacy to an ultimate point and at the same time offer it to the future, to the many. Let's say, please God, us too. Because the gift of his body as food and of his blood as drink enabled this. Because uh, nothing enters our flesh and blood selves so intimately as food and drink. And if that food and drink are the body and blood of the risen Son of God, they inter enter into us in a way that goes beyond all else. There's nothing like it. You know, forget sex, really. Nothing like it. Okay. Uh, is not the cup we drink, asked St. Paul, a communion with the blood of Christ and the bread we break, a communion in his body. And again, you remember how in his high priestly prayer, Jesus prays that they may be one, as we, as you, Father, and I are one, that they may be one in us and one in the Father and the Son with each other. Jesus is initiating a new human unity. Human beings, we instinctively hate each other, really, really. And, and we go off and we, and, and in all directions. Fission, fission as it were, we are, we are centrifugal creatures. Uh, and Jesus is bringing us back. And the, the unity the Eucharist brings about is both personal and corporate, communal. But we'll come up back to all that at a later date. So that's just a very brief sketch of this third element. And it's connected with the whole idea of communion, the whole idea of the Paschal banquet. So here, again, what was Jesus intending at the Last Supper? And once again, in the Eucharist, he, in the Eucharist he institutes, he presents himself as the true lamb, whose sacrifice and blood will not just set us free from social slavery, but from the slavery of sin and death, and open for us a way to a new world, to the kingdom of God. But just as the sacrifice of the lamb is completed by eating the lamb, uh, so his sacrifice is completed by us eating him. Through communion in the body and blood of Christ, we assimilate his whole self, his body, his gift of self, his blood, his love to the end, and we are able to live this in turn if we open ourselves to it. So the institution of the Eucharist really was the founding act of the church because the church is the body of Christ, the body of Christ. Well, that's sort of it, well, that is it. But I mentioned before John Paul II's phrase, Eucharistic amazement. I think we, we should be amazed if we begin to ponder even on the Last Supper. It's already amazing because it is very human. It is very human. It is a farewell meeting, a farewell meal. It's full of emotion. 
but at the same time, it's so all-embracing that Jesus' thought and his love reach back over Israel's history, in a way reach back to creation, and they reach forward to the church uh, in the, in, and the future. So in the upper room, Jesus makes room even for each and all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.